All right, so since some of you guys were asking for another Raised by Wolves video, I thought I'd roll out another Raised by Wolves video. It's so great to see people watching and commenting. Um, so yeah, I wanted to address uh, the idea of the central question that Raised by Wolves asks is, um, I think the central question is basically about technology and if technology is in fact a gift from God or a gift from Lucifer, from Satan. This is a central question that has long plagued <laughs> religious texts, specifically um, the Judeo-Christian tradition um, in what's known as the Book of Enoch, which we'll talk about today. Um, the Book of Enoch is not included in the Hebrew Bible, in the Bible, but it was a really popular text way back during the first century CE about. Um, it was one of the favorite texts of the time. And we'll talk about with the Book of Enoch, kind of their approach to technology. So yeah, in the show, we see this idea of this Pentagon-like shape, this black shape that gives off heat. And a lot of people have been asking, what is it about this? What's going on? If it looks kind of like the Kaaba or <laughs> other kind of religious structures, right? Um, the Kaaba is, instead of a Pentagon, is, has four sides, is a square, is a perfect square, but it's black kind of like um, this pentagon shape. And in the case of the Kaaba, they say it goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. It's important because what is this thing, right? It's seemingly an inanimate object that is also yet mysteriously animated, right? This pentagon shape. What I mean by that is it looks like just a rock but when they go up to the rock, it mysteriously gives off heat and it also does some strange things, right? It follows Marcus specifically and um, kind of helps Marcus out and destroy his enemies, right? So in that way, it is technology. It's a form of technology because you have to think about technology as a seemingly inanimate tool or object that has the ability to be animated. So think about it much like a text. Right, texts are one of the first technologies humans invented to share their ideas. Um, texts are, look like nothing, right? If you showed them, for example, to an animal, to a dog, to an ape, a text would look like nothing. It would look like a rock. It would just look like, like, what are you looking at? Yet for humans, texts have so much meaning and they're animated. They come to life. There is a life behind texts, right? It's the same thing with a computer. Think about a computer. If you showed your computer to your dog or your cat, they'd be like, what are you looking at, right? What's going on there? To them, it's nothing. It's just a stone. It's, it's an inanimate object, right? But that's the idea with technology is that um, it's seemingly inanimate objects or tools that, that come to life, that have meaning, that do things. Okay. Uh, so... I think that this kind of Pentagon shape is referring to this idea uh, because there's some belief, right, that this idea of the inanimate being made animate is not just a certain like magic behind it. You know, there was a belief, for example, that texts were magical, that were infused with magical abilities, right? This ability to make the inanimate animate. Um, there is a certain magical potency there. But I think also it's an alien kind of technology. Well, it's alien to us, alien to biological life. So if you think about things that are biological, right? They're fully animated, right? They are not inanimate, right? Typically that's how we define life, right? Think about a dog, something like that, right? It's moving around, it's doing things, stuff like that. It's biological. Biological life is also fully animated, but it's also degenerative. Okay, so um, biological life degenerates. It is self-destructive in that way, right? Think about cells. Cells um, are made pre-programmed to self-destruct, which is why we are self-destructive. You can think about biolog biological life is inherently self-destructive. And the earth itself is inherently self-destructive. I mean, there's a time limit to the earth, right? Certain billion years, eventually the earth will collapse and die, right? <laughs> Everything dies that's biological. Now, this is at odds with the idea of technology, okay? These objects, these tools, and that they are not nearly as degenerate as biological life. 
So even think about this text. This is, I have a text from the Book of Enoch, right? This text um, is dated to the first century CE. So it's 2000 years old and it's still alive, right? And we see the words on the page. It's still being animated. It still has meaning. That meaning is still being informed. So it is still technically alive, right? It's 2000 years, right? So technology has the ability to kind of go on forever, it has a certain longevity, has a certain eternality to it, a foreverness, right? That can keep going on and on and on, right? In a way that um, biological life cannot, right? Biological life is more self-destructive than the technologies that we create, such as a text, right? I mean, like the Book of Enoch. And the ancient Egyptians had this idea too with um, mummification. So the idea with mummification was to create a technology, to use tools, that could basically transform the human body into a machine so that it could continue to live on, right? To almost machinize, mechanize the body, turn it into a technology itself or a tool. It's kind of similar to what Silicon Valley wants to do with uh, human bodies right now with um, cryogenic, uh, free, you know, putting bodies into cryogenic freezers and then taking that DNA and then putting it in a new body or is very similar to actually how ancient Egyptians imagined technology, right? So there's a longevity to it. So it is alien to biological life. It is something that is at odds with the way things are on earth. Right? Like think about a text that is not being self-destructive or not nearly as self-destructive. It still is self-destructive, right? A text can wear away, a computer can wear away, right? Things like that. Um, but uh, there's a certain longevity there that we don't necessarily have. Also, biological life is fully animated, whereas something like a text or a computer or your phone, again, is this idea of it is inanimate, yet it is seemingly simultaneously animated. So in the show, I think it's kind of playing with this idea, and there's this um, great evolutionary biologist named Terence um, Deacon, in case you're interested, Terrence Deacon, definitely look up his work. He suggests that actually technology, specifically communicative media, because according to Terrence um, Deacon, all technology is communicative. It's, it's, its purpose is always communicative, to increase communication in some way, somehow. Communicative media, he calls it, right? All technology at the end of the day. Think about a computer, right? What does a computer do? What's the computer doing now for me? It's allowing me to talk to all you guys, right? And carry that out. It is increasing my communicative abilities. Um, and that's why also uh, computer scientists, right, call computers language machines, because they're ultimately seeking to increase and facilitate human communication. Um, and, and computers themselves are programmed by language, right? Computer languages, right? Alphanumeric texts. At the end of the day, machinic language is zero, one, zero, right? Right, it's numeric, but it's nonetheless based along language. So all technology for Terence Deacon comes back to language, okay? You don't have technology without language. And according to him, he kind of sees technology as almost parasitic to the human mind, the human body, and that it becomes embedded into us um, and we co-evolve along with us. So to kind of get this point of what Terrence Deacon is saying is that think about an idea that travels on Twitter, right? One person has the idea, they say it on Twitter and then it's shared by 100,000, 500,000, a million people and the idea goes viral, right? It takes over um, and there's this idea that according to Terrence Deacon, these technologies take over our minds. They're embedded in, into our minds. They influence human behavior, human society, and the development of human civilization. So you can kind of think about, because Terrence Deacon looks at like um, the neurobiology dynamics of the human brain and how language, so I don't know if you guys have definitely, like I said, check out his work, uh, a human brain, uh, for example, human children who were raised in, without environments of where language was constantly being used, um, kind of kids who, for example, were in orphanages who didn't really have access to text, uh, didn't have access to human language, people talking to them, things like that. Their brains develop differently than children who are embedded with language-rich environments. They literally have two different 
cranial structures. Um, the neural links in their brains are, are fundamentally different. And you can also think about how um, they're saying generations born today, right, have different, will have different brains than us right now because they have been raised in an environment of digital technologies and the way that they interact and understand their world is fundamentally different than the way previous generations will understand their world. So language is not immaterial to human evolution, but it is that according to Terence Deacon, language and the technologies that kind of power this language is uh, what's powering human evolution. So for him, uh, you know, this idea, it's, it's, a lot of people have probably heard of the idea of um, natural selection, things like that, right? So Terence Deacon's moving beyond that, right? Because early evolutionary theories didn't even really consider language, <laughs> didn't really consider uh, that as kind of saw language as immaterial to human existence. Whereas Terence Deacon is placing it at the center and, and showing that at the end of the day, what is a tool? A tool is something that allows you to better communicate, right? So, excuse me. <clears throat> Anywho, so it's fundamentally transforming human existence. And, and like Terrence Deacon also talks about that these things are alien to biological life. They are fundamentally different from biological life, yet they are co-evolving with humans to fundamentally shape and influence humans. All right. And oftentimes, this is a key point. It's not, we're not being influenced necessarily. This is the question that I think comes down to and raised by wolves. Are we evolving in positive ways or negative ways? Uh, and how are we evolving? Because this is kind of a scary thing that Terrence Deacon deals with, is that uh, we're kind of, it seems like we're evolving to a stage where all they'll be left is machines, all they'll be left is technologies, all they'll be left is techs, uh, seemingly inanimate objects that can be animated, <laughs> um, you know, kind of like a matrix. So think about like the matrix, right? Where the machines kind of take over that kind of stuff in that human life is almost becoming impossible on this planet just because of various um, environmental issues and things like that. And, and like I said, the earth itself has, it has a lifespan, but machines do not. Machines have the ability to persist beyond our kind of uh, static notions of time. Yeah, so the question is, are we being evolved out? Or are these uh, technologies that have become almost parasitically embedded into us evolving humanity into some sort of like post-human age, right? <laughs> where you live in a post-human age, that's where it gets kind of dystopic uh, a little bit. Um, so, and I think, so in the case of Raised by Wolves, right? This is the central question as well, because we have this idea of the Mithraic who get this technologies um, and they don't know where they come from, yet you know, they come down, right? Um, I think they come from Kepler 22b, but, uh, and they don't really understand them. And we talked about before that this is a key idea that humans, while they mo may know how to use technology, for Terrence Deacon, the scary thing is humans don't know how to understand technology. They don't truly understand what a computer is, for example, specifically that it's a language machine and what that means, what language means, that language is actually alien to biological life. So taking this point back to Raised by Wolves, we see this kind of idea, I think, playing out in that the technology here leads to this bad war that ends to the destruction of the planet. And there's very few humans left. And it seems like humans are almost evolving um, into a state of non-existence, into some sort of post-human age where all there is left is this Pentagon, <laughs> right? Is the inanimate object, the technology. Um, yeah, and like I said, in the Book of Enoch, so this isn't a new idea. Uh, actually, um, Wrigley Scott really likes the Book of Enoch. He knows about the Book of Enoch. So um, he's talked about the Book of Enoch before um, in some of his films. Like I said, it was the most popular text from the, he from the Bible at the time of the first century, back when like Jesus was alive. It was one of the most popular. And it's, a po and it's an apocalyptic text, right? That depicts kind of an apocalyptic scenario for humanity. And in this apocalyptic scenario, basically the machines take over, <laughs> right? So it's almost like a Terminator, a Terminator or Matrix written 2000 years ago. In the Book of Enoch, technology is not good. Technology is something to be feared, and technology is actually something from Satan. 
something from Lucifer. Um, and in the Book of Enoch, it kind of hypothesizes that humanity is going to use technologies and obliviate, obliviate itself. Um, so there's a really big fear with the Book of Enoch with technology, even text, which is interesting because the Book of Enoch is actually using texts, but the authors don't think of texts as, as um, part of this technology. So they're thinking more of like new musical instruments, new ways of doing ceramics, <laughs> new ways of doing carpentry, things like that. So it's kind of interesting to think about that it in and of itself is using a technology, but is it self the community that wrote it maybe wasn't self-aware enough to know that. But, uh, but they did think that text should be closely guarded so that we should be afraid. Um, there is a notion in the Book of Enoch that we don't understand the technologies. We know how to use them, but we don't understand them, right? Common idea. So I think in the Raise, in Raised by Wolves, it's kind of playing on this idea. I think Ridley Scott is exploring this further. Um, and like I say, so most of our kind of machinic, dystopic, kind of apocalyptic scenarios come from the Book of Enoch, which already forecasted it 2,000 years before the Terminator, before Wrigley Scott made his Terminator 2,000 years before came the Book of Enoch. So he knows a lot about it. So I think we're seeing that Book of Enoch like scenario, like I told, uh, told you all in an earlier kind of discussion is that um, we're seeing the reversal. The Book of Enoch also does this cool thing where it reverses what you think reality is, your perception of reality. So the Book of Enoch reverses, you think you're following God, but you're actually following Lucifer. Uh, so it reverses what you think your perception of reality is. Uh, you think God's speaking to you when it's actually Lucifer. So I kind of talked about this idea too, which is something that we see in this show. I think the Mithraic think they're think hearing God, but they're actually hearing Lucifer talk to them. Uh, they can't. And, they, and the Book of Enoch, scary enough, kind of uh, prophesizes that this will happen, that humanity is very bad at knowing who's speaking to them, God or Lucifer. Also, I think, uh, though, it's not necessarily that technology has to be a bad thing. So this is what's very interesting is because the reason I talk about Book of Enoch, it's the most popular text during the time of Jesus. Uh, the New Testament has, and Jesus has a very different perspective to technology than the Book of Enoch. And that right away, Jesus is described as a technologist, a technon, right? A technologist. Oftentimes it's translated as carpenter, but it actually means technologist. So someone who's skilled in technologies or tools. So you can think of him kind of like, it would be like uh, Elon Musk or something like that, or <laughs> someone who's like really into tools and technologies. And Jesus kind of has, in the New Testament, has him facing off with Lucifer, with technology. Um, and there's this idea that Jesus basically says to Lucifer, right, in the New Testament, like, yeah, technologies can be used for bad, right, when he's in this wilderness for, I think it's like 30 days and 30 nights, something like that, or 60 days and 60 nights, ah. My Bible knowledge is bad, but he basically says he will, humans also have the ability to use technologies against you, Lucifer, um, to improve themselves. So we can take this thing that is alien to us and use it to improve ourselves. So all hope is not lost. Technology doesn't have to necessarily lead to a dystopic apocalyptic scenario. Um, so I think we kind of see that play off in the show too with, um, Rickley Scott and uh, mother, mother who I said is probably a cyborg and is half human, half machine and doesn't realize it. That's what Terrence Deacon kind of has hope for humanity is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a dystopic apocalyptic scenario where the machines take over. But if humans can find a way to merge with these machines and become cyborgs, they can actually take what is alien and parasitic to them and take control of it and make themselves better. And they can avoid that apocalyptic scenario actually. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that humans are co-evolving along with these language machines, right? Specifically computers for Terrence Deacon, but it actually could lead to really positive future scenario where humans could end up making themselves better in a post-human age um, by, by finding a way to merge. But the question is, how do you merge with technologies effectively without losing your sense of humanity, 
right? Which is, I think, a central question that the show is exploring with Mother, which I Wrigley Scott always likes to explore with the Terminator films, right? It's the difference between a human and machine. When a human and machine merges, how can a human maintain their humanity while still being also a machine? So I think that's what this question kind of the show is exploring with this question.